couple of quick announcements. As usual, on Wednesday, I advertised the biology seminar on Thursday. This week is a particularly, well, at least for me, exciting week. Uh, Dr. Thomas Kunkel from the NIH will be talking about eukaryotic DNA replication fidelity. But basically, he is one of the real leaders and pioneers in molecular biology, particularly in terms of DNA polymerases and how DNA polymerases work. And I'm going to ask him what he thinks about DNA polymerases being derived from RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, of course, because of the, the neat fold that all of us remember. Um, and we'll be remembering next week on a certain exam thing that's happening. The other announcement I wanted to make has actually absolutely nothing to do with molecular biology or virology. Some of you may know there's a bike commute challenge going on. Any of you bike to and from campus and are not on a team yet, join the biology team so we can crush chemistry. <laughs> so there's actually a, a chemistry team as well. If you, I, I won't hold it against you if, if you decide that that's the way you want to go. So today, we're going to talk about Ebola um, and other fun filoviruses. But first, I wanted to finish up talking about the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. And one of the take-home messages today is going to be that Ebola and the other filoviruses are basically big, long paramyxoviruses, um, certainly in terms of the way they work molecularly. Of course, in terms of disease, is a very different story. So <clears throat> continue with the, again, mononegavirales. Um, and where we were at last time really had to do with replication and more messenger RNA production rather than translation per se. So a couple of things. Again, this is a slide that I finished up with last time. There are a few things that are very important in terms of this switch between making messenger RNAs and making genome. So messenger RNAs, you have this start-stop thing. RNA-dependent RNA polymerase binds to one of the genes, gets to the intergenic region. In some cases, will fall off and go back and start again. In other cases, it will stay on and restart a new messenger RNA. And also, you have this stuttering process. You remember, stuttering is when you've got this stretch of U residues on your template. You make a whole bunch of A's, poly-A tail. It's what you need for your translation purposes. But for replication, there's a couple of things which are most important. And the really main one of these has to do with the N protein, um, the nucleocapsid protein, and the concentration of this N protein. So the N protein, of course, is the first messenger RNA which is made. It's at the 3' end of the genome. You also have sequences at the 3' end of the genome that, not surprising, that's where the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will associate. Um, and <clears throat> the big question is really, are we going to make messenger RNAs or are we going to make genome? And that really depends on, it's easier to look at on this slide, the concentration, again, of this N protein. So if you've got a whole bunch of N protein, which is what these gray spheres, or I guess ovals, are more supposed to be, um, you will bind to all of your RNAs, because that's what this N protein does, nucleocapsid protein, will bind to the, the genome. If you've got lots of this nucleocapsid protein around, it'll bind to the RNA. And if you remember, hopefully all of you do, um, that the RNA is wrapped around the outside, remember, of the nucleocapsid. So if that's bound to the inside of the RNA, then this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will actually not stop and stutter and start again. It will continue to make RNA through the whole rest of the genome. So again, it's all having to do with the concentration of the N protein. Low concentrations of the N protein, i.e. you've just started making messenger RNAs, you're going to continue to make all these messenger RNAs, eventually make the L protein, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And then over time, you're going to make more and more of the N protein, which will 
eventually lead to coding of the RNAs. And as soon as you have the RNAs be coded, then this 3' prime end here will be where the RNA polymerase binds. Instead of stopping right here, it will keep going all the way through the opposite end of the genome. Then you have an antigenome. This antigenome will now serve as a template to make even more of your genome sequence. So again, this is this balance of messenger RNA versus genome sequence, and it's all about the end protein. Uh, I think you asked last time about PCV and the various different editing processes. That's what we'll talk about next. Um, there's, okay, maybe back up a little bit here. There's this messenger RNA down here, you know, P slash C slash V. Why the heck do you have three genes being made by one messenger RNA? The way that happens is actually two different ways. One of those is, in fact, exactly the same thing that happens in the intergenic regions to add lots of A residues. In this case, what happens is you end up adding a couple of extra G residues during the RNA dependent RNA polymerases processing here. And all that does is just change the open reading frame. So that messenger RNA now has either one extra G or two extra Gs in it. In some cases, actually make three extra Gs, but then you go back to adding a glycine in the P protein, because, of course, the genetic code is a triplet code. So you end up with three different proteins just because of this stuttering. And this is all, of course, at the C-terminal end of your protein. But there also are different start sites, different AUGs that can be used, which will give you other proteins. So this is actually really similar to... What particular kind of genome? Aspen Lindsay talked about so far? Aspen here? Heat Tran? No, nobody's here today. Um, Laura Scannell? Yeah. So the question is this use of multiple open reading frames is most similar to what virus we've talked about so far? Pardon? Flaviviruses don't usually use multiple different open reading frames. We talk about coronaviruses, which just use one, but I'm thinking about a different one. Roll back even further. Oh. Um, like before the last midterm where you've forgotten everything. PHIX-174, exactly. So that's the one which is using, in this case, you're using all three different reading frames. You're also using all three different reading frames. What does that mean about those proteins, though, you're using all kinds of different reading frames? Why don't all viruses use, or why don't we use all of our different open reading frames? Oh, because... A lot less room for error, and so what does that mean about the proteins that are being made? Um, Very specific, uh, but the reason these are these have been maintained evolutionarily. So what does that mean about these particular proteins? How likely are they to be really important for function? Oh, less yeah, important. Less yeah, so be a lot less important for function, also very often tolerant to lots of changes and still be able to be functional. So um, exactly the same thing is true here. The P protein is mm, absolutely necessary, phosphoprotein. Um, C and V, much less so. Y, you seem to be able to get rid of, and the virus seems to be perfectly happy. Uh, but these processes um, of this frame shifting, um, also people think about it as stuttering, that's um, another way you can get these different genes. And again, in this case, um, C and V seem to be not very important for function. We'll see that's a big difference when we talk about the phyloviruses um, a little bit later on. Okay, so I'm not quite sure why I had this um, slide in here. Basically, it's the exact same thing before again. Um, N is binding to your genome, and you stop getting this stuttering process. And again, it probably has to do with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and how it's interacting with the substrate um, RNA um, as it's moving. So we've replicated our genome. We've made all of our proteins. The next thing you need to do is, of course, take the virion and put it outside of the cell. Most of these, again, with the exception of the rhabdoviruses that we talked about last time, they're going to 
bind to the plasma membrane and fuse with the plasma membrane. So not surprisingly, that's also where they're being produced. So budding happens here at the plasma membrane. All of your viral envelope proteins are produced. They're put into the plasma membrane through the normal secretory process, which includes those proteases, which you have to have in terms of making fusion peptides. Those then associate with matrix protein and the ubiquitous RNP. What the heck is an RNP? Who's next on our list? Steven or Steve Alcaraz? What's RNP stand for? Colette? What's RNP stand for? Ribonuclear protein, exactly. So what is this ribonuclear protein? What? What is the RNP? Um, well, the RNP is also like ribonuclear cells. Mm -hmm. So ribonucleoprotein. So that's, no, it's not ribosomal, but it's ribonucleoprotein. So maybe I misunderstood you and you got it right even though I didn't think you did, <laughs> which is great. Um, ribonucleoprotein, what are your ribos and nucleos? And then what's the protein? Okay, so what are we doing here? What are we, what's this process? Okay, this is, so we're budding. Is budding coming in or going out? Going out. Going out, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, so let's, let's think about what, what is this? Very gently, very gently, exactly, okay. So, what's in this virion? Right, all the little squiggly bits. What are these squiggly bits? They're also labeled here. Ribonucleoproteins. So, what's the ribonucleo and what's the protein? Okay, ribonucleo must be like the iron protein. Exactly, and the protein is. Okay, which, which protein is it? N L P C V Y. Why? Yeah, the nucleocapsid protein, exactly. So it's nucleocapsid protein plus genome is the RNP. So, yes, yeah, so this is the RNP process. And again, ribonuclear proteins, we'll see this again and again and again, at least for the next two lectures. <laughs> we talk about RNA viruses, and also, again, we talk about uh, HIV a little bit later on in the course. So um, that's this process, um, how you get budding. And it seems to be most of the association between the RNP and the matrix protein. The other, I think, important thing to mention here is that these membrane proteins, particularly the G protein, and to some extent the F proteins, these fuse with plasma membranes, right? Because that's how the virion is releasing its genome inside the cell. Well, if you have a cell that's producing a bunch of these G proteins on the outside that's next to another cell, what's going to happen? these cells are actually going to fuse with each other. And so this makes what people also call syncytion, which turns out to be a great way for viral genomes to get from cell to cell, not unlike what you see in some of the plant viruses and their movement proteins moving from cell to cell. But this seems to be the kind of protein which has been stolen from a virus infection and used in all placental mammals in order to get the placenta to form. So the syncytial proteins making syncytia are pretty clearly virus-derived. So the reasons that all of us have moms, great timing for Mother's Day, um, is because of a viral infection in our ancestors. I find this is kind of mind-blowing, but that's a different story. as Well, then just as a reminder, um, the genome itself has to be 
multiples of six nucleotides because that's what the end protein binds to. Each of the end proteins binds to six nucleotides. And if you have any free bits at the end, the hungry exonucleases will chew it up. Yeah, Nicole. Okay, syncytia are two cells that are fused together. And that's what you need in terms of the production of the placenta. And in that case, instead of the F or G protein, it's called syncytion, the actual protein that's involved in the mammalian, or so they say, placental mammal development. Whole fascinating story that I'm happy to talk about some other time in more detail. Okay, more questions on these paramyxone rhabdo. And as I'll see, we'll see that the filoviruses are extremely similar to this. Yes, Jacob. So the so I guess I'll I'll, I'll paraphrase here um, and correct me if I'm not answering your question. The G proteins or the F proteins, so G from the rhabdos and excuse me, the F protein from the paramyxos. Um, these are just called glycoproteins and fusion proteins. And these are specific viral ones. Is if you do the phylogeny and look at the current mammalian syncytions, those are clearly related to these proteins. But if you think about it from the point of view of, you know, where are you getting membrane fusion? This is really the first one we've talked about that fuses at the plasma membrane. Almost all the other ones have been endosomal. And so plasma membrane fusion makes a lot of sense because that's where, again, you're getting these cell-cell fusions that are going to take place because that's the outside of the cell. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I think um, you're sort of driving as when does the proteolytic cleavage take place before you can have fusion take place. Um, that happens, actually let's back up here um, quickly to the, the fusion slide. Um, that's going to happen during the production of, come on, let's get this thing to work, uh, the production of each of these membrane proteins here on the outside. So they'll be processed through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi, and that's the point that the cleavage takes place. So it's actually before. So once they get out to the outside of the cell here, these are now competent to fuse. Okay, more paramyxo rhabdo questions before I ask you one that everyone's going to get 100% on because that's what we're aiming for, right? <clears throat> Let's actually start this. That might help. Turn my clicker on. Everyone has had a lot of time to think about it, so we should be good to go. And again, if we get more than 90%, then we'll move on to the next part. And if we get 100%, then we're definitely good. The now I have to do the calculation, OK, of 46. What's 90% of 46? <laughs> 48. <laughs> Okay, what do we have? Let's see. 94%. Very good. I either didn't make a hard enough question or I've been explaining it well. I'll let you decide which one of those you think is the correct one. Okay, so somehow I ended up starting the wrong presentation here, but that's fine. So we'll go back and find the correct one.
Okay, so big picture with the filoviruses. They're big mononegaviralis. And, of course, hemorrhagic fever, which is why lots of people get interested in them. A um, couple of the key concepts. This one should sound really familiar. Um, RNA editing. Turns out the RNA editing is actually extremely similar to what happens in the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. The only really major difference in terms of their regulation has to do with this transcriptional regulation. And they actually make a transcriptional, and people talk about transcriptional regulation here. I like to think of it more as the messenger RNA production regulation, and then, of course, um, the hemorrhagic fever. Uh, I don't have one of the giant microbe Ebola models. I think I need to get one. It's um, based, of course, on this, excuse me, uh, micrograph that was done at <clears throat> the UT Medical Branch. And UT Medical Branch may or may not sound familiar to you because the ex-head of UT Medical Branch was going to be the new president at OHSU. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the structure, genome, proteins, editing, and then finally um, the origins down here at the bottom again because the molecular biology of these viruses is extremely similar to the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. So these are, the virions, I should say, are these long filamentous structures, as you just saw on that last slide from the EM. They've got a genome with nucleoprotein associated with it, They've got an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They have a similar protein to the P protein, VP35. And then they've got a couple of extra proteins here. This VP30, this is the one which is the really major difference between the filoviruses and the paramyxoviruses. Um, G protein, just um, in order to make things more confusing for all the students, just called GP rather than G, but glycoprotein on the outside, matrix protein, which is this um, VP40. I'm not going to ask you to remember all of these different VPs. Um, the only one that we're really going to talk about in any detail is going to be this GP protein and the VP30 protein. So if you look at these genomes, they should look extremely familiar. Back up. They've got eh, a three prime leader sequence, the NP protein, VP35 and 40, this GP protein, VP30, L protein, and all of these intergenic sequences. Um, I've just put down the paramyxovirus genome down here at the bottom. Um, again, these should look extremely similar to each other. Couple of short um, differences. Uh, these intergenic sequences are practically identical. They've got these ends with a bunch of U's and start sequences. But these guys actually have some overlapping reading frames here with starts and stops right in the middle of these genes. Quite why that is, we really don't know. Again, why in biology the answer is always going to be what? Evolution, exactly. It works, so we don't mess around with it. Um, so. Um, ever so slightly different as far as that's concerned. The proteins that are encoded in this genome, glycoprotein, very similar to that G protein that we saw in the rhabdoviruses, heavily glycosylated, binds to receptors, important for fusion of the membranes, et cetera, et cetera. VP30 is this one which is associated with nucleocapsids and activates messenger RNA production. And so that's sort of the, the big difference here. The GP protein, again, extremely similar to what we see in the rhabdoviruses. The G protein, it's one protein which is important for both receptor binding and fusion, made, not surprisingly, through the what particular cellular process? Well, where are we now? Um, keep running. Amy. Which cellular process are these things made by? It's one protein, but it's got these funky two little lines on it. What does that mean in terms of how it's being made? Proteolysis, proteolysis exactly. So one, another one of these proteolytic processes um, where you have production um, of these particular viruses. And look, it even says cleave by furin. <laughs> 
conveniently. Um, so <clears throat> these, again, are highly glycosylated. All this process seems to happen, again, just like we've talked about for paramyxos and rhabdos, in the processing, in the ER, and the Golgi. These are trimeric proteins. Um, again, this is something that we'll see again with flu on Friday. Um, this trimeric proteins, why trimers? Really good question. Nobody really knows. Um, seems to be something which, again, evolutionarily works quite well. Um, for a long time, the receptor for this protein was not known. Um, but then, for relatively obvious reasons, about four years ago, people got really interested in this. Um, it turns out that this is protein called Neiman Pick C1, which is great and wonderful, but we're really not even entirely sure what Neiman Pick C1 does. Yeah? What's the noodle in this picture? The noodle. <laughs> um, the noodle here is this, it's disulfide bonded to the rest of your protein. Um, this would also, you could also call this GP1. So the whole thing starts out as GP, and then, as Amy told us, it gets cleaved, it gets proteolized, <laughs> um, and then you end up with these two separate um, proteins here. Um, so these are two separate proteins. So the noodle is, was originally attached to this cylinder, and then after cleavage, you end up with this um, cylinder, and then Clearly, you have to also have a conformational change to expose this fusion peptide. That conformational change happens when you have interaction with this neiman pick c one So it's a receptor binding dependent process, um, as opposed to just like a pH dependent process, which is what you might see in some of these other viruses. We now know what the structure is of this neiman pick c one protein. Um, this incredible transmembrane protein, it's got, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 12, 13 transmembrane helices, um, and it's this part which interacts with the GP from the Ebola virus. Um, again, what this protein does in cells is not very well known and, and somewhat controversial. Um, a few people are mutated in this gene, what's called neiman pick c one um, and those people are, not surprisingly, resistant to Ebola virus. Unfortunately, they have all kinds of other problems, so not something you would necessarily recommend. But um, this is then that structure of what these things look like. So how do you make these messenger RNAs, like the GP, etc.? cetera? Um, review last lecture. Um, start, stop, again, RNA polymerase comes down, starts at the 3' end, makes the NP protein, decides whether to fall off, go back and make some more. Um, we'll stutter, make some more <clears throat> of the next messenger RNA until there's lots of the NP protein around, at which point it switches over to making antigenome and genome sequences. So basically, all the stuff we talked about at the beginning of today is completely applicable as far as replication of these filoviruses later on. And it also buds at the plasma membrane um, there's a matrix protein, again, that interacts between the GP and the RNP, which, of course, is the genome now plus the nucleocapsid protein. Um, there is also editing that happens in these proteins. Again, it's a stuttering process. Um, in your unedited RNA, you have this stretch of A's. As soon as you have some stuttering that takes place, you end up with an extra A here, which changes all of your downstream amino acids. Um, this is actually kind of interesting. This editing is absolutely required for function. So unlike the case in the paramyxos and the rhabdos, where you seem to not need too much of this editing process, here you don't even make your normal GP, which you need to bind to the receptor and for the virus to get inside the cell, unless you have this editing process. And people actually showed this, this experimentally. Um, you can change the last nucleotide in these sequences so that the polymerase doesn't get confused because it's not a whole stretch of A's that it can put um, U's opposite. And then you don't get any of this editing, and you can end up with either a 
non-functional because this SGP is made, or all of just the GP. So what is this SGP? SGP is just a secreted like a protein. So that's that noodle, noodle. <laughs> um, which is now made in the absence of any kind of extra fusion protein. So it's released outside the virion. It's just secreted. Does not seem to be absolutely necessary. People think, and again, this is kind of speculative, that what it does is it kind of confuses the immune system. And so the immune system binds to all of this secreted glycoprotein. And then the actual virion just kind of slides in and is not noticed because all of the immune system is dealing with these secreted glycoproteins. So that's, that's the thought. Whether that's actually true or not, I think, is a, an open question. But that's why people think that this has evolved in that particular way. So the other <clears throat> thing I wanted to mention, again, in terms of differences. Oh, yeah, Jacob. The secreted glycoprotein, I don't think it does. I think it's actually missing that disulfide bridge, um, as well as missing the cleavage site in terms of, of making it. But I'm not absolutely certain on that. I could go back and look at the sequence, but I'm not absolutely certain. Yeah? Is the signal protein another one where it's like just outside noodle, noodle sort of glycoprotein that, that doesn't really have a function beyond sort of the sigma protein? Um, Oh, this, um, I'll maybe back up here to, which, um, in VP24, you mean, or I'm not sure? Like, okay. There was one that, it was like SGP, they weren't entirely sure about its function. Okay, I don't remember that, um, which I don't remember, I won't expect you to know, but I will look it up and see, because I, it's my understanding, I think sigma protein and SGP might just be, Synonyms for the same thing, so but I'll I'll check. Yeah, Margo. Pardon? Oh, the the cleavage of the noodle in terms of making this um, GP. Yeah. No, it's not the cleavage which is making competition. Maybe it's also somebody sent your question. It's just. It is now functional after you have cleavage. If you don't have cleavage, it's not functional. Yeah, exactly. It's like a maturation, as we've talked about in many other cases already. OK, so the only other thing which I've promised is different um, is this transcriptional regulation. And I don't like transcriptional regulation because I always think about that as going from DNA to RNA. And of course, all this is doing is making messenger RNA. It has nothing to do with DNA at all. Um, but if you look at the five prime end of this um, nucleoprotein messenger RNA, it makes this hairpin loop structure. And this hairpin loop structure blocks the production of any more of this particular messenger RNA. And the only way you can make more of this is if you have VP30. Now, again, why evolutionarily? What this seems to do is make sure that everything is at a relatively low level until everything gets turned on. And so you make a small amount of each of these different proteins. And then once you have all the proteins you need, then you can turn on much more production of the NP protein, and make a whole bunch more virions. Again, this is a process that people have found because people have done a lot of work on these particular viruses and have now you know, figured out that this is one of the, again, major differences that we have between the paramyxoviruses and the phyloviruses. More questions on this process? So everyone gets out their clickers. So we'll have one more review question. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and so the, the thought was that there could be these hairpin structures that form in the energenic sequences, which, again, is probably this whole sort of damping process. Until you get enough of the VP30, then you can turn them on. But if you remember, VP30 is also in the virion. So when the virion first comes in, 
you're already ready to go for all of these things. Um, and then it gets turned down a little bit until you make enough more, and then you can really make the whole thing. So, yeah, but it is important, and thanks for reminding me, that the VP30 is in the virion, and because of that, you end up getting the messenger RNA production as soon as the genome is released. Okay, everybody ready? Clickers at the ready? Oh, maybe I should turn it on. <laughs> it's not even Monday morning. What's my excuse? Second Monday. Can we get 100%? Can we get 100%? I stopped it because I noticed it was 100%. <laughs> And I, I saw somebody, somebody was messing with their clicker and trying to confuse me. So when, as soon as I cut it off with one second to go. <laughs> so yes, it is the GP protein that interacts with the cellular receptor, which is, who's up next? Colette? No, we had, uh, we had sorry, getting the ground. Jikarit, probably totally mispronouncing it. No, Devon? Oh, sure. Um, what is the cellular receptor that it's binding to? Neiman pick C1, exactly. So <clears throat> a lot of this was, discuss oh, was figured out, actually, with, sorry, let me make sure everybody gets points for this. That would be good. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this work was done through figuring out how to make bits and pieces of these viruses and study them in the lab. And this was a major problem, not surprisingly, as we'll talk about disease-wise. No one really wants to work terribly much with these viruses that can kill you and there's no real good treatment for them. Um, so a lot of this process was done in places that look a lot like this. Um, anybody have any clue, and I'm not going to put anybody in the spot for this, where this is? You see palm trees. <laughs> um, this is the place that the new president of OHSU came from, UT Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, which is one of the very few places in, actually in the world, that has a BSL-4 lab. And this is, in fact, the BSL-4 lab right here, um, which is actually a BSL-3 lab, biosafety level 3 lab, that has another lab built inside. It's a building inside a building. And the architecture with these things is really fascinating. I actually met some of the architects that designed this building. And one of the first questions I asked is, Galveston, Texas, hurricanes, high biosecurity, is this really a good idea? <laughs> and it was really interesting because they said, we can see hurricanes coming, unlike earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or other kinds of things like that. And they, have, they say, we can see them a few days out. We know they're coming. We design things so that they can be shut down. The BSL-3 lab is actually here with no, there are no windows. Um, and all of this down here can be completely flooded. And in fact, in, um, I think it was, was it Ivan, I think? Um, they actually did have flooding up to here. Um, they closed down the BSL-3 lab, closed down the BSL-4 lab, had it up and running like two weeks later after the hurricane was gone. So um, they did a really nice job of designing this whole process. Um, this entryway here, by the way, is way worse than any kind of TSA check you could possibly imagine. I've actually gone into this. I went into the BSL-3 area. I wasn't even allowed to go into the BSL-4 area, but it went into the BSL-3 area. Um, in fact, in that building, 
is where the microscope is that was used to take that picture of Ebola virus. So how many of you want to be you know, take, doing microscopy with Ebola viruses? You want to make sure it's a pretty high containment area. So a little bit of an aside there. But um, also wanted to mention how you go about making these negative strand RNA viruses in order to work with them in a lab like this one. Again, these are negative strand RNA viruses. Cells don't usually make negative strand RNA viruses. Negative strand RNA viruses have to have RNA polymerase associated with them, and they have to have all this nucleocapsid protein associated with them. So in order to make these viruses in the lab, you have to go through all kinds of molecular craziness. Um, one of these is to have a complementary DNA to your Ebola virus genome with everybody's favorite promoter and favorite the independent RNA polymerase, T7. So you can make the genome, but the genome by itself, of course, is nowhere near enough. So you also have to make the various proteins. So we need the L protein, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. We need to make the nucleocapsid protein. We need to make this VP30 in order to make sure you can get actual messenger RNA being produced. So you've got to make all of these different proteins in order to get one of these infectious virus particles. So it's a pretty complicated process to put all of these different things together in order to actually now have a functional virion, which you can now study. But the neat thing about this is you can actually now tweak all of these things. You can make mutations in VP30. You can make mutations in the GP and figure out that it binds to neiman pick c one for instance. Yeah? How do you regulate the various different concentrations um, of these different proteins and the RNA? Um, you can have various different promoters for each of these different proteins. You have to kind of get lucky in order to get enough of each of them. And it's very much a, a balancing act to try and get this. And you usually have very little infectivity, which means you're probably pretty happy because you know, these are not terribly infectious. But if you're trying to work with them, um, you end up with very few infectious particles in this process. OK, so <clears throat> everyone knows about Ebola. How many of you know about Marburg virus? OK, how many of you know where Marburg is? Yeah, it's in the middle of Germany. <laughs> Conveniently, because you can actually, how many people knew you're going to be doing uh, geometry and geography in, in your virology class. So yeah, Marburg is right, a very cute little town um, in the middle of Germany. Um, also has this nice castle. This is just um, up the street from where I stayed when I was visiting the Max Planck Institute for Terrestrial Microbiology. Um, this virus was in, um, discovered in Marburg in the 1960s. Where do most of these phylo virus outbreaks happen? in equatorial Africa. So what the heck are they doing discovering these things in Marburg? Um, they were looking at monkeys, which had been imported, which then were coming down with disease. And then some of the people in the lab came down with these diseases. So they name it Marburg fever, but the vast majority of cases are in <clears throat> sub-Saharan Africa. So this is where most of these cases happen. And this is not just. Um, the Ebola virus cases, Marburg um, outbreaks. So yes, this is Marburg, Angola. No, Marburg, Germany, but that's where the virus was discovered. Uh, and eventually, it was originally found from here. Then the original Ebola outbreak is here in the DRC, very close to the Ebola River. And so that's why it's named um, Ebola virus. All of these different phylovirus outbreaks. And there were about 500 cases before. 2005. Um, so relatively low number. You'll also notice in these, each of these regions, the orange regions, um, pretty self-limiting. So this is the maximum amount of spread that was seen for these different outbreaks. Many of these places are really pretty remote, um, with a little bit of exception of this um, Kikwit out outbreak. And Kikwit's a relatively larger place. And then. There was an Ebola virus outbreak in Western Virginia. So what's in Western Virginia? Any ideas? I'm not going to put anybody in the box. Yeah? 
Yeah, so there are some animal biosafety and it's like where most of the primates are kept for the work that's done at the NIH. So, and I think the, the chimpanzees, um, when they were still experimenting on chimpanzees, they've now all gone into retirement, um, were also all in rest in it. So this was a phylovirus disease that was infecting monkeys, but interestingly enough, did not infect humans. And so the rest in Ebola virus has turned out to be a really nice tool to study these Ebola viruses because it's not as dangerous for humans. For non-human primates, it's pretty nasty. But for the human primates, it's actually pretty good. So you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, that one probably came from the Philippines. It's not entirely certain whether that was the case, but that's probably the case. Um, people have gone back and tried to find it since then. They haven't, at least back in the Philippines. Yeah, Mario. So the basic question is, can basically the... so. Back up a little bit. This, is, this is, doesn't seem to be a attenuated virus, so it wasn't a human infecting virus which then just was uh, replicating in primates. It seems to be a completely primate virus. So, um, well, this causes an, a phylovirus like disease. And so they actually call it Restin Ebola. And we may get a chance to talk about this a little bit later. There's also a Zaire Ebola and various and sundry other Ebola viruses. That's, the nomenclature for Ebola viruses has gotten kind of confusing and has been changed quite a few times <laughs> recently. But um, so the, all of them are called Ebola viruses, but there are different locations that they've been isolated from. Then we'll get a particular name that goes with it. So Zaire Ebola virus, we have the Reston Ebola virus. Um, Marburg is different enough that it's called a different virus family. All of them, however, are phyloviruses, and all of them cause um, nasty disease. Yeah. When was rest in Ebola discovered? Good question. I'd have to go back and look it up. Um, but uh, a number of years ago, well before um, the stuff we're going to talk about for the rest of today. So I think it was either in the late 90s, early 2000s, but I'd have to go back and check on that. Pardon? Ah, okay. <laughs> so um, it was also, as far as I can tell, constrained to the animal facility. And so didn't, and I don't think there have been any human cases. Maybe there's been one or two, but none of them have been nasty like this, the 30 to 90% fatality rate. So again, you know, why do people care about Ebola? Why do they make all of these uh, huge posts? Actually, this is a fundraising campaign for MSF. Wonderful organization. Yeah, we can get back and talk about that later. But basically, people who come down with the, um, any of these phylovirus diseases, so not just the Ebola viruses, Marburg as well, um, have very high fatality rates. They're hemorrhagic fevers. So basically, you apparently end up bleeding out of all kinds of different orifices, which is not very nice. Um, Macrophages are the things that seem to get infected. Um, macrophages, of course, are those immune cells that seem to react and try and protect you from disease. Well, as soon as you start infecting macrophages, then that is going to be a pretty major problem. It's become obvious that this is a zoonotic disease, probably from these cute little bats, at least I think they're cute. Um, and what happens is, is that as I, we saw before, in, in most of the original cases of the outbreaks, they were relatively contained, didn't spread very far, but spontaneously just reappeared every few years or so. And probably what's happening there is there's some kind of spillover from the reservoir, and we talked about the reservoirs for the coronaviruses before, particularly for SARS, that then end up in humans. And then um, basically the transmission of these diseases is when you're very close to and you know, literally bodily fluids kind of contact issues. So most of the spread in humans is very close family or unfortunately medical personnel because they didn't really know enough about the disease and how to prevent this kind of 
aggression. Highly immune suppressive, again, not surprisingly, because it, I'm interacting with macrophages. And then the media loves this because you've got this really high um, fatality rate. Um, and until 2013, there are only about 3,000 total cases. Um, there's more on this um, Reston virus, actually, by the way, if you're interested. Um, on the TWIV, um, this week in virology, no Reston for the weary. <laughs> they have the uh, variation into, into puns, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, so your question? Sorry. So the, the 30 to 90 percent is in various different outbreaks. And sometimes the 30 percent, it was up to 90 uh, percent. But you also had relatively few numbers, and that's sort of what I'm getting to here in terms of looking at fatality rates versus infection rates, um, et cetera. Um, the first report of any kind of phylovirus disease was in 1967. And up to 2014, there had been about 2,000 deaths. Um, and again, this is around 70%. I can do the. Um, and the outbreaks, there were probably about 50 different outbreaks that had happened, clearly different separate outbreaks. Again, since people started looking for this, probably it's been around for a lot longer. If you talk to some of the indigenous peoples in these areas, they've had these you know, crazy diseases that have happened on a not infrequent basis. So it's quite probable that some of these things were happening um, a lot further on. Um, one of the nice things about these, again, as I mentioned before, basically the way you get infected is through really close contact. The virions are pretty wimpy. Um, they fall apart pretty quickly with heat, detergent, um, a little bit too much light. But again, direct contact. And one of the things which people found much more recently is that the amount of virions which are produced in an infected person is ridiculously large, very, very high, what people call viremia. So number of virus particles that are being produced by an infected person. But at least up until 2014-ish, it was actually very hard to get a viable virus to try and put it into cell culture, to try and work with it, to try and get the sequences, and to set up some of these things um, before. But of course, um, everybody loved this. Um, you may or may not recognize Dustin Hoffman here. This is Outbreak, um, a really bad movie, um, but that's a different story. Um, so that was well before this. Um, interestingly enough, um, 2012, which was you know, a few years after I started giving these lectures, we had yeah, one case in Uganda. This is pretty typical in terms of the outbreaks. Um, uh, seven cases in Uganda, four of them died. Um, 24 cases, 17 of them. 2012, 77 cases and 36 deaths. Marburg, similarly, um, 2012, 15 confirmed, eight probable, um, and 15 people died. One tourist died in 2008, and one US tourist was infected with Marburg, again in Uganda. And people got really excited about it. They made movies about it. But the numbers were really, really small. And that's what I'm basically sort of putting, um, looking at. But then I was lecturing not in this room, but in this class, about this time in 2014. And there were quite a few cases in Liberia and Guinea, um, and about 150 deaths, with a, unfortunately, pretty high fatality rate, many of whom were healthcare workers. And this is you know, kind of scary, um, particularly given that Liberia and Guinea were not places where there was thought to be much in the way of Ebola virus disease, and people really weren't ready for it. So this was the case um, in April of 2014. Um, a few places, literally right on the border between Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. These areas are very, um, I don't know what the right term, very much in a development kind of area. This is a picture of the main marketplace in Kisidugu. Um, this is pretty typical non-paved streets, a few motorbikes for getting around, um, lots of um, pretty obviously not terribly well-off people. And the place where people think that the latest outbreak, or the, say, the West African outbreak happened, is this place, um, Meliandu, Guinea, in December of 2013. Again, the only way you can get here is by motorbike. 
Most people um, are walking in terms of getting from place to place. The borders here are sort of lines on a map, but uh, lots and lots of people moving back and forth between these different areas. Um, again, where is this? Right at the border between Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Again, 2014, four years ago, lecturing here, 200 cases, about 140 deaths. Pretty typical. Everyone figured it was just going to go away. Well, it didn't go away. And this was the Guinea case. And May 2014, um, we had a couple hundred cases. It looked like it was going away, which is what most people thought would happen with most of these uh, outbreaks of these phylovirus diseases, but then things picked back up again. And there's actually a really nice New York Times article, which is actually where I got that picture of um, the potential outbreak original site. Um, we basically thought it was self-limited and we weren't going to worry about it. Um, unfortunately, 2015, where we had these cases, um, has now completely expanded. It's really gone nuts. And the main problem here seems to have been, A, that most people said it's self-limiting and we're not going to worry about it. The second thing is it started to get to the main population center. So the original outbreak was here. Then it got to some of these much larger cities in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Um, and these are just literally the number of cases. And in each of these individual I believe they're provinces, I'm not absolutely certain here, um, up to 4,000 cases in some of these. So relative to the couple of thousand worldwide known between the late 60s and 2013, now we're talking literally about thousands of cases. And this was something that nobody was ready for by any stretch of the imagination. So. Eventually, uh, people figured out that it was really this person-to-person -person transmission, very close contact that was an issue. Um, but because of the viremia, just huge amounts of production of any of these people who were infected, um, basically PPE was, and this is why Brown brought my picture here, um, of all of the people who were working with these patients. Um, and most importantly, one of the things that um, I wanted to point out here as well is that it was also a lot of the, um, not so much indigenous people, but the locals who then were empowered to deal with this whole situation, again, by production of the appropriate PPE, um, production of, and so, you know, this is your sort of um, typical shack, and then right next to it, we have this you know, high-tech um, setting up here. We have people who are getting um, their PPE put on by other people in terms of finally getting to slow down the progression of this disease. This was the case, see, um, in 2015, so about a year after that, still um, a certain number, this is not now numbers of cases, this is the number of days since the last case. And it turns out that the incubation period for Ebola, in this case it was mostly the Zaire Ebola strain, is about three weeks. And so any time that you're beyond this sort of darker purple, there's really, um, seems like there's very little disease which is still left there. And this was sort of finishing up. And mostly, again, it had to do with the appropriate use of personal protective equipment and making sure that everyone who was involved with the, the patients, people dealing with the corpses, et cetera, were then having appropriate PPE. So <clears throat> these were the data um, in 2015, getting up to 2016. Um, total numbers of cases are now... 26,000, 28,000, and then the final numbers here were actually up to 28,000 cases. Um, these are the suspected ones. There were definitely 15,000 cases. 
and over 11,000 deaths that happened through this particular outbreak. So literally multitudes in terms of deaths and infections relative to all of the previous outbreaks before. Yes? So how far do I want to go down this rabbit hole? <laughs> so the question is, um, why fewer reported cases in Liberia, but a higher number of cases? Or you mean the laboratory confirmed cases and the actual total number of deaths? This number? Yeah. So uh, Liberia, um, for all kinds of different reasons, um, decided to kind of go it alone relative to Sierra Leone and Guinea, um, having to do with their governments. Um, and a number, there was probably a lot of under-reporting here, um, and also um, a lot less in terms of the laboratory availability. Fewer of WHO and MSF came into Liberia, and so that's probably why these numbers are relatively low, but probably also why the number of deaths are actually relatively high. So this, you know, tens of thousands of cases and you know, over 10,000 deaths. Um, this people got really excited about or depressed about, scared about, et cetera. Um, how many cases in the US? Four. Um, two of them were actually imported from West Africa. One person died because they were turned away from the hospital because they really didn't have a clue what was happening before they came back again. Um, so, Amount of risk in the U.S., pretty low. Americans concerned that they or their family will contract <laughs> Ebola. 51 million people in this poll in you know, August of 2014, and at that point, um, number of Americans who had contracted Ebola. <laughs> well, it's funny in some ways and not funny in a lot of other ways as well. Jacob. Yeah, the numbers there are so low relative to this that, um, and this is kind of leads into this question, <laughs> um, which is, you know, people got very scared about these things. There were whole shutdowns in terms of air traffic, et cetera, to any of these places. And the actual number of deaths outside of West Africa was very minimal. And even those, this is you know, some of the neighboring countries, Nigeria, Mali. If you get rid of Nigeria and Mali, there was um, one outside death of this whole outbreak with literally, you know, tens of thousands of people being infected. That, uh, sorry, I'm not sure that answered your question, Jacob. Is that, is that that? Pardon? Which cases? So this is um, here, 34 cases, 15 deaths total. And this is in that same outbreak where you had spread happening. Yeah, Margo. Yeah, exactly. And they were medical personnel who were taking care of these people. Um, two nurses, in fact, if I remember correctly, both in Texas. So, and the one who died actually had brought the disease um, with them um, from West Africa. Yeah? Couldn't these low numbers also be interpreted as a perspective with handling the situation and not that we were blew up something out of proportion, but that we actually blew it to the correct proportion and then handled it? So that's. So what are those two people that infected two more people, and then we didn't restrict air traffic and all this stuff, and then there was an outbreak, and we lost 50% of the population? Okay. There are some. Yeah, we could talk about this for a long time, and it's almost 10.05, and so we'll, we'll stop soon now. Uh, but the, um, my concern about that is a lot of this stuff, and I tried to emphasize this as well. Um, a lot of the problems and reasons that it spreads so rapidly in these countries is that their infrastructure was 
very limited. And unfortunately, when a lot of the medical personnel are dying, you have even less infrastructure which is available. And so there could have been more of the outbreaks in the US. But in fact, the first case where they kind of ignored it um, was where someone had died, and then you had a couple of people who were infected. But this massive amount of interest, you know, 50 million people who are frightened, and every time I go, have you visited West Africa when you go to the, the doctor, um, was, I think, a little over the top. Okay, so we won't have our another clicker question here. It's 10.05, and it's a bad question anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we'll talk about flu on Friday. <laughs>